Okay, now we're going to talk about lower respiratory uh, med disorder medications. Again, I'm not going to go through the disease processes. You know about COPD, you know about asthma, you know about pneumonia. Um, <clears throat> most of these meds may not be used for pneumonia typically, uh, but could be helpful. So if you need to review those disorders, then um, please do so. Uh, expectorants, uh, one of the problems with um, you know, COPD and pneumonia and asthma is the production of mucus, which can block uh, the airways. So expectorants can help to alleviate uh, that blockage by thinning the mucus, uh, reducing the viscosity or thickness of the mucus so that it can be uh, brought up and out um, more easily by coughing. So uh, the anticipated effect then of an expectorant is to be able to cough up uh, phlegm. The two um, most commonly used expectorants are guaifenesin and um, something solution of potassium iodide. I, I know I'm a sucky instructor and I can't remember the names of everything, huh? Um, anyway, SSKI, something solution of potassium iodide. Um, both of these medications truly require that the patient be well hydrated. So they need to uh, use the medication with lots of fluid. Uh, Quite venison, especially the way that it works, is to draw fluid into the mucus, and you know, kind of, kind of like um, some laxatives. And if that fluid isn't available, then that mucus is just going to sit there, thick and and uh, drying out, and make it much more difficult for the patient to breathe. Um, <clears throat> Quite venison is. Uh, found in all kinds of over-the-counter um, cough and cold medicines, um, usually labeled for chest congestion. Uh, you can get higher doses by prescription, but bifenacin tends to be the most effective over-the-counter expectorant available. With um, bifenacin, uh, GI upset, uh, and nausea vomiting um, don't occur too often but it can be bad enough that the patient uh, doesn't want to take it. Uh, SSKI, uh, we can have uh, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Uh, best if it's taken with food or milk. Um, and because of the potassium um, Oh, not the potassium, because of the iodide. That wasn't making sense. I was reading that, it didn't make sense to me. Um, because of the iodide, uh, excessive use of SSKI could affect thyroid function. And so that's something that if it's being taken long term, that the patient uh, may need to observe for. Guaifenesin has no uh, medication interactions. Uh, SSKI. Uh, should not be taken with potassium sparing diuretics or probably with uh, people with uh, renal disease and um, large amounts of potassium food or salt substitutes uh, because of the risk of hypercholemia. <coughs> now, antitussives um, are used for controlling the cough. Um, they're against which is coughing. Um, opioids are the most effective antitussives that we have, um, but because of the risks uh, involved of uh, dependence, then we don't use um, opioids uh, very often. Now, when you think of a cough, you want to think of a cough as a symptom of an underlying disorder. So, with that being said, um, 
we may not always want to stop the cough because the cough sometimes is protect protective. It's helping us clear out whatever is in our, our lungs and our bronchial tree that's causing irritation. Uh, so we could have an acute cough of an upper respiratory infection, a chronic cough uh, related to, say, smoking. Um, could be a cough related to medications like ACE inhibitors. So we need to know for sure what is the cause of the cough before we try to suppress uh, the cough. So usually when we're going to give an antitussive, it should typically be for a dry, hacking, non-productive cough. Um, if a patient has a productive cough, then they probably don't want to be um, inhibiting that cough at all. Again, dextromethorphan is found um, in all kinds of over-the-counter cold and flu preparations. Uh, it's very well tolerated, no risk of dependence um, because it is, has a uh, connection with opioids. It may cause sedation in, in susceptible people, but for most people it doesn't uh, do anything but help them with their cough. Diphenhydramine we've talked about already. Uh, you know it best as Benadryl. Um, part of its anticholinergic uh, effects um, is that it can help to uh, dry secretions. Um, and that can be useful for um, some conditions of the lower respiratory system. But we want to be careful because drier secretions are thicker and they're more difficult to remove. So again, we don't want to use that um, for anything that you know, it's imperative that we get those secretions out. So if the patient already has a thick, tenacious secretions or volume of secretions, then diphenhydramine may not be the best option. <clears throat> but it can, for some people, alleviate a cough as well. Now, mucolytics uh, work by actually breaking up mucus. Um, it dissolves the bonds within the mucus, so it reduces the viscosity or thickness and makes it smaller so that it can be expectorated. Um, acetylcysteine or mucomist uh, is an inhaled uh, mucolytic uh, used primarily in cystic fibrosis, but it may also be fit be beneficial in some instances of COPD. Uh, we're going to see that by breaking up that mucus, uh, it's easier to remove and that can open up the airways so we get better uh, airflow. Um, if the patient is weak, uh, they have uh, weakened respiratory muscles, a weakened diaphragm, uh, you know, for what for whatever reason, then the breaking up of those secretions <clears throat> and, the, and as they try to mobilize them, they might only get them so far. So you want to be sure that you are prepared to suction uh, that patient. Occasionally, uh, the movement of those secretions can irritate the bronchi and cause bronchospasm. So a bronchodilator might be needed uh, as well um, as the um, mucolytic. One of the problems with acetylcysteine is that it has a rotten egg smell and so um, compliance might be an issue. Should not be given with uh, antibiotics, um, especially if, if the um, Antibiotic is given uh, also by inhalation, not very many are, but it would inactivate um, if given by inhalation. 
we can use long-acting bronchodilators such as salbuterol or albuterol. These are beta adrenergic agonists. So essentially we're going to relax the smooth muscle of the bronchi by stimulating the beta 2 receptors. Um, because it's long acting, salmeterol and albuterol are typically going to be um, used for long for prevention of bronchospasm. Now albuterol sometimes is used for a rescue inhaler, but not always. Um, but it's important that if a patient is taking salmeterol, that they understand that it is uh, long-acting, meaning it is not going to be useful for an acute bronchospasm, uh, and they need to use their rescue inhaler. <clears throat> when used as an inhaler, uh, it has fewer uh, side effects because there's less potential for stimulating the beta-1, so we get fewer systemic effects. Um, it's typically selected for beta-2 receptors, so we're going to see the bronchodilation without the uh, tachycardia that we might get from stimulating beta-1. But Nonetheless, we may still see uh, nervousness, restlessness, tachycardia. Um, if these things are limited, meaning they last just a short while or the heart rate is not um, elevated excessively, then we can just consider this a normal um, effect of the medication and let it go at that. Um, because it's long acting, it has a duration of approximately 12 hours. And um, so if it's, if it's inhaled, it's less systemic. If it's oral, it's obviously going to be uh, more systemic and um, have more uh, beta-1 stimulating properties. Any time that the patient is taking more than one type of, of um, uh, inhaled medication, such as they're taking a bronchodilator and a ster steroid, we always want them to use the bronchodilator first. As a general rule, anytime they're using inhalers, they need a minimum of one minute uh, between puffs. Uh, Salmeterol actually works better if they wait 10 minutes uh, between puffs. So the first one, because it's long acting, I mean, I think that that makes sense um, if you think about it, that because it's very long acting, uh, it's going to take a while for that first puff to work. And if we want to open up those small bronchioles deeper down, then we need to wait that length of time in order to allow uh, the second puff to get uh, deeper. Make sure that the patient is using the equipment correctly. Uh, if they're using the inhaler, they should rinse their mouth uh, after use. And they can develop a tolerance to the, uh, the um, bronchodilation. So if it doesn't seem to be working as well, uh, then they need to seek uh, medical help about that. You know, they need to go to the doctor. Because uh, either they're developing a tolerance or um, their condition is worsening. <clears throat> Caffeine, because it's a stimulant, uh, can increase the um, beta-1 effects and um, they should have frequent respiratory function studies done just to be sure that uh, everything is going well.
So I hope this is still recording because it just got hung up a little bit. We'll see. So bronchodilators, anticholinergic bronchodilators, <coughs> we have ipratropium and tiotropium. Um, this is causing uh, bronchodilation by inhibiting the parasympathetic nervous system. Um, usually when we're using an inhaled uh, anticholinergic, then we get, again, we're going to get fewer uh, systemic effects. Um, because it's an anticholinergic, it's going to be less effective than the beta stimulant that we just talked about. But it can have an additive beneficial effect when used with other bronchodilators. It has very few interactions, but again, because it is an anticholinergic, we are going to see some side effects, uh, including dry mouth, uh, irritation of the throat. Dry mouth especially tends to be self-limiting. Uh, other anticholinergic effects such as tachycardia, urinary retention, uh, exacerbation of other pulmonary uh, symptoms. Again, this is not a fast-acting bronchodilator, so it is not for an acute episode in progress. <coughs> Patients need to make sure you need to make sure that patients understand which of their medications can be used for an acute attack and which ones need to be um, used on a routine daily basis to prevent bronchoconstriction. Now, xanthines, we, we very rarely see um, the xanthines used anymore uh, because we have newer, safer uh, drugs that we can use. The xanthines have a very narrow margin of safety, and they have a lot of drug interactions. Um, they uh, are very stimulating. Uh, they are chemically related to caffeine, so... Um, People using uh, theophylline and aminophylline uh, typically uh, seem to act like they're on uh, speed. They're jittery, they talk fast, uh, they're constantly making little small movements and just bounce, seem to bounce around from one side of the room to the other. Um, and so it, it's not used very often uh, anymore. But you might still occasionally see uh, them around. Uh, inhaled glucocorticoids um, are anti-inflammatory. Uh, we know that that's what steroids do. Um, Beclomethasone um, is our prototype, I guess. Um, it reduces inflammation so that it decreases the number of attacks um, or frequency. It is not a bronchodilator, so it's not for acute attacks. Uh, typically, because of um, being inhaled, it is not um, systemic uh, unless the patient isn't using it correctly and again it builds up and they swallow it. So most of the symptoms that we're going to see are going to be orally or upper respiratory. So one of the things that can occur is that it can irritate the larynx and cause hoarseness of the voice. Uh, it does increase the risk of infection, especially orally. It uh, increases the risk of, of a candidial infection or yeast infection. And then, of course, if it is used, um, overused or used inappropriately, systemic effects of adrenal insufficiency uh, could result. So, to reduce the risk of candidiasis or oral infections, make sure patients are rinsing their mouth after each use. And to increase the effectiveness, again, we want to tell them to use um, the bronchodilator first. Using an inhaled glutocorticoid uh, is one of the most effective things that a patient uh, can be given to prevent 
an acute asthma attack as long as they use it on a routine daily basis as prescribed. Typically, um, they need uh, to hold their breath uh, for several seconds, uh, up to 10, I believe, um, after they inhale to make sure that the medication has time to absorb uh, into the tissue um, to be most effective. Now, oral glucocorticoids can also be used. They're going to have a more um, systemic effect. This would be, uh, we would see oral glucocorticoids used most likely uh, in the event that um, perhaps there was some type of environmental uh, irritant uh, and the patient was having um, numerous attacks not being prevented by other medications. Um, but because of the risks involved or, of the adverse effects, um, Treatment typically with oral glucocorticoids is limited to five to seven days. Uh, if it takes, if it's taken for longer than ten days, then we increase our risk of adverse effects, which include the adrenal um, gland suppression, uh, peptic ulcers, and hyperglycemia. Now, leukotriene modifiers are also anti-inflammatories. Um, <clears throat> Montelukast and Zafirlukast um, are examples of leukotriene modifiers. Um, so the leukotrienes um, are part of the inflammatory process. Um, so these are going to reduce inflammation and ease uh, bronchoconstriction. Again, they're prophylactic. They're not a bronchodilator, so they're not for acute episodes. Uh, they're typically given um, orally. Side effects typically uh, are headache and nausea that uh, goes a little time. And they do uh, increase the anticoagulant effect of aspirin and warfarin. <coughs> 